So you want to say a couple words? <laughs> All right, uh, I guess uh, thank you for having us here. And uh, once again, my name is Edgar Silva, and this is Moana Yamagami, and we're from Rice University down in Houston, Texas. And uh, we've been working on this uh, device for uh, about a year now. And we were first uh, told about this uh, issue by a uh, hospital in Malawi, uh, where currently about two nurses uh, take care of 70 babies. Now, it's hard for nurses to actually go around to each baby uh, and check for the temperature. So what we're working with is um, actually providing a low-cost uh, and effective monitoring system. Uh, temperature sensors uh, cost about $500, but Moana will t uh, speak a little bit about our solution. Okay, um, I'm gonna keep this short. So basically we're building a temperature monitor, so if any of you guys are uh, making something similar to that, please come talk to us after this uh, session, and yeah, we'll love to talk to you. Great, thank you, and I'm sorry I didn't explain your... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you did a much better job than I have. Okay, so we're going to present you with the certificate, and we're going to grab a picture, and then we'll go on. So the next new commitment announcement is, um, her name is Vanessa Nascimento. I hope I did that, said that pretty well. Um, basically her project relates to um, proper counseling of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is a, a subject that's near and dear to all of pediatricians' hearts because breastfeeding is best for, um, for babies. And so her project actually um, um, committed to daily volunteer-led in-hospital education seminars for underprivileged new mothers at Hospital de Evangelo de Ponta Grossa in Ponta Grossa, Brazil. So Vanessa, if you could come up. <laughs> Congratulations. Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa. I attend the University of Central Fro Florida in Orlando and I just wanted to say thanks for listening to my commitment and everyone's commitment that I've heard so far has been so inspiring. So if you guys have any other ideas or anything you'd like to talk to me about about my project after, you're more than welcome to come up to me. Thank you. Great job. And last but not least, we have Kimberly Sai and Nikita Singh. And uh, basically their work is in Tanzania. And in Tanzania, only one in 10 children from rural areas had registr registered births by the age of five. However, recent efforts by the government to en enable registration via text message has greatly increased urban registration rates and have shown great promise in reaching other mothers around the country. So Kimberly and Nikita have committed to increasing Tanzania's rural health uh, birth registration rates by developing an innovative rapid SMS pre-registration program that links rural midwives directly to government registration databases. That's pretty incredible. So Kimberly and Nikita, come on up. Hi everyone, my name is Nikita Singh. I'm from the City University of New York at Queens College. And I think everyone here has an, um, an awesome commitment and we're just really honored to be here right now. So we're pinching ourselves just sitting next to these amazing people over here. Um, and we're just really honored to be able to share our idea. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, I think we're moving. Where's my stage manager? <laughs> okay, uh, I think we're ready to, to move on to the moderators, uh, to the, the session. If we can bring the panelists up on stage. 
him a round of applause. How does everybody like our weather, by the way? <laughs> okay, so um, to my immediate left is Jordan Shimmerhorn, and next to her is Mohammed Zazu. And next to Mohammed is Dina Borzakowski. And I really am looking forward to this um, discussion because um, we have a lot in common and uh, I think that everybody brings to, to the table a very significant and um, um, worthwhile perspective on um, improving child health um, throughout the world. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start on the, the, the questions. And we're going to do this for about 30 minutes or so, and then um, we are going to break out and have some discussion, and first a question and answer session, and then we're going to basically um, have some time to allow the, the, the uh, panelists to walk through the room, and, and you all are actually going to be able to brainstorm some ideas um, at each individual table. And then after that, we'll have a couple of you come up and present your ideas. So that's kind of the flow of the way this is going to go, okay? So um, let's just get started, okay? All right, so I'm gonna just basically ask a, a, an overall broad question and then open it up to you all to, um, to answer. So a common theme with all of your work, actually, is uh, utilizing technology um, to improve the overall health of young children. So can you share your perspective as to why you feel various forms of media including the internet, television, video, mobile devices, has made an impact on improving child health? Well, for me, um, I think one of the most important um, aspects of improving child health is connecting with parents and working on that level. Um, so just to give a quick summary of, of what I do, I co-founded Dunya Health, and we send text message reminders to parents um, who forget their children's immunization appointments or don't come for some other reason um, to prompt them to return to the clinic. Um, and I think sometimes if you're operating on a hospital level or on a clinic level, um, you can sometimes forget how important that interface is. Um, so I think technology is something, especially if you're dealing with young parents and young mothers, all of whom have cell phones, it's just the easiest way to actually get your message out and to talk to them on an individual level in a way that is perhaps less formal and less intimidating than talking to a doctor might be. Um, and also less stressful um, because you can do it on your own time. You don't necessarily have to be connecting in a perhaps stressful or, or um, confusing way um, if you're in the clinic and your child is right there. It's much easier sometimes to communicate through other mediums. Um, in, in my case, um, I started five years ago trying to spread health education to people in, um, in Egypt, mainly children and their parents. And honestly, I was extremely boring and no one listened to me. Uh, <laughs> so I, I tried to see what was going wrong. And what was going wrong is that people don't really believe that health education is important to them. There is a misconception that health education is for the doctors. And when you're sick, you'll go to a doctor and you'll get prescribed whatever medication you'll be on. And this is in their own eyes, this is being proactive because they went to the doctor. But the point is they waited until they got the disease. So I had to step back and think like an entrepreneur would think like before introducing a product or a service to the people. He w and the first thing he would do is that he would respect the market and he would respect the demand and supply rule of the market. So if there is no demand for health education, no matter how passionate you are about introducing health education to them, they would not listen to you. And I started to think that I need to create demand for this. I need to provide them with a product that's so appealing to the children that they would want to get this product. And then there would be hidden health education and messages in them. So I created a storybook for them called Montasar Yantasar in Arabic, which is basically Montasar overcomes. And this young boy, Montasar, is overcoming a different disease or a different bad health habit in every episode. 
And then when the children started to like it, during the story, they started to learn the clinical picture, which is a very complicated uh, piece of information if you provide to children. They just get to know, is he coughing? Is he having a stomach ache, a headache, or whatever? And then what did the doctor tell him? What, what, does he, what should he do to overcome this disease? And most importantly, how can we prevent it from happening in the first place? So very complicated health education messages, very accurate health education messages. For example, in the uh, book for uh, Montasso Overcomes Pneumonia, the um, evil characters are called Hemo and Nemo after Haemophilus influenza and Streptococcus pneumoniae. So very <laughs> difficult <laughs> terms can be given to children. Um, to cut it short, and then we tried to introduce more technology in this. So we, we made it into a coloring comic book. Now it's double the fun for the children. They are coloring and getting the information. And then we tried to introduce more technology by producing cartoon movies of very good quality. It's not as equal as Disney or Pixar and so on, but it, it is much better than an educational cartoon would be like so that the child would not feel that this is an educational thing. And this is the most critical part. Get to him with a product that he would want to get and then put your messages in it. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Dina Borzakowski. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland. And um, how many of you, show of hands, have watched Sesame Street? Okay, that's who I work with. Um, so I work with Sesame Workshop internationally, and I've helped develop some of their international programs, such as in Tanzania, South Africa, Indonesia. And now I'm currently working in India, Bangladesh, and Nigeria. And what we do is we evaluate what are the needs of the community, what are the needs of the children. And we then create messages and embed them in entertaining programming. So whereas in the United States you learn literacy and numeracy through Sesame Street, in some of our programs in Sub-Saharan Africa, we introduced issues around HIV and AIDS with CAMI. And in India, Bangladesh, and Nigeria right now, we're doing work around diarrheal disease with a new Muppet named Raya. So we embed it, we connect and we go to where the kids are, which is watching entertaining programming, and we embed educational messages. Can you introduce us to those I characters? I can do it now right if now? you want. I think it would be fantastic. So, so this here is Cammy. I'll stand up with Cammy. So this <laughs> is Cammy. Cammy was introduced in 2002. Cammy is an HIV positive Muppet who's an orphan. And the coolest thing about Cammie is she really is not about HIV or being an orphan. She's about learning her letters and numbers with her fellow Muppets. She does talk about compliance. She does talk about grief. But usually, you'll just see her singing and dancing along. Just last spring, we introduced. Get up there. I can do this loud enough, I'm sure. This is Raya. Raya, here. Raya teaches about hand washing, using the latrine, and wearing her sandals. And we're doing research right now, and we're collecting data about how she's having an impact on kids in some of the most vulnerable situations in the world. Fantastic. So Jordan, um, Jordan is a former c commitment maker, and I would really like to hear more about your journey in uh, where they're sitting to where you're sitting today. Um, yes, I was. I remember actually being in a public health, the, in the audience of a public health panel last year. So it's quite odd and surreal to be a panelist um, for a similar situation now. Um, so my project got started. Um, right after, I'm a graduate student at Duke right now, um, and my project got started right after undergrad. My friend, just someone who lived in my dorm, um, we didn't even work together in, as undergrads, um, but she was from the Gaza Strip, and she went back with her family um, for a summer, and she was like, hey, we found all of these problems with people missing immunization appointments, and we were talking about it really casually, um, and she was happening to go on to optometry school. I was going on to get my master's in global health. Um, but this problem still really grabbed us, and we decided that we wanted to do something about it. 
Um, so the way we got started was by cold emailing people at the UN. It was very um, probably above anyone we thought would actually respond to us, and um, it actually paid off, and we somehow got connected to, um, to a department um, of the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency, and we gave them our idea. We said, hey, we want to use cell phones to, um, to connect with, with mothers and remind them about their children's appointments, and he said, yeah, come over. Um, <laughs> so I got on a plane. I had never been, this was my, I think, second time out of the country. I had never been to the Middle East before. Um, but I got on the plane, went to Jordan, um, where everyone made fun of my name, and um, <laughs> and uh, just got started. They took me to a clinic. I met the nurses. I saw the problem um, and started building a, a sort of a prototype solution with them. Um, and so th I did this the summer before I started graduate school. Um, and I think the most important thing I've done as a student who's working on a project is collapse my responsibilities as much as possible. How many of you guys um, get enough sleep? <laughs> Good for you, the one person <laughs> in the back. <laughs> um, so, so for me, I think it was really important to, I really wanted to keep working on this project. It was important to me now that I had, had relationships with the mothers um, and relationships with the clinics we were working in. I, I did not want to stop that just because I was going back to school. Um, so I tried to, to condense my responsibilities as much as possible. I made this my thesis project. Um, so again, just making it so I have fewer different things to manage and work on. Um, and then I think one of the most important things you can do as a student is use that title to your advantage um, while you're a student. Everyone wants to help students. You get to come to this conference, for example. Um, it's much easier for people to want to provide funding or advice or, or just to their time to students than it is to provide it to a random 22-year-old or like a random 23-year-old. So I think it's important to, um, during this time, to use that title to your advantage as much as humanly possible. Um, and for me, that really resulted, that resulted in coming to CGIU for the first time last year. And I think what comes along with that is a degree of um, validity. It's like if your project um, is good enough to get into the CGIU, then as people take you more seriously. And I think that's another thing you can use to your advantage. Definitely, definitely. Mohammed, um, tell us a little bit more about Montasser and also um, how, how you feel that the messaging empowers the children that watch this. And after that, we I'm curious to know what's the next character and disease that you're going to focus on. I, I'll tell you a, a short story that actually happened uh, with the child. He was five years old in a slum area next to Cairo. So we're talking about someone who has never been to school, who doesn't even have a school or a hospital in his area. And we were telling him the story of Montasser overcomes pneumonia and Himu and Nemo and how these evil characters were going to kill his friends and so on. Um, and after we were done, there was a sandwich in the hand of the child uh, and it fell on the ground. So his mother took the sandwich from the ground, she just tried to clean it with her, her, her hands, and she gave it back to him. Uh, so he told her, no, I can't eat it, it has hemo and nemo. <laughs> so actually there was a much deeper meaning in what he said. I didn't tell him I did, uh, anything about gastroenteritis. I didn't tell him anything about the real diseases. But he started to understand the concept of microorganisms. We're talking about child, an illiterate child to illiterate parents in a slum area. He understood what's microorganisms, that he can't see them, but they are in anything which is not clean, and they would hurt him, whether it's through the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, or whatever. So actually, there is a lot of impact in this. Another incident, when we went to uh, a nursery, um, kindergarten school uh, class, and then the students, they usually didn't wash their hands before eating. And after telling them the story of Montosser, before going to the break, one of them told him, wait, we have to go and wash their hands. So this is the peer effect. We didn't force them to wash their hands, and a lot of them were actually going to eat without washing their hands. But the peer effect and the information they got from the cartoons actually made someone take the extra step to educate his friends. What's next for this? Um, it's, I'm sure you know better, it's a huge investment to create a whole series of cartoons or puppet shows or uh, any sort of these media products.
for children. So we hope that we, we would be able to produce a whole series so that in each episode it tackles a different disease that creates a burden in the developing world. And we hope that they can be translated to different languages in the developing world. We provide all our products free of charge to any country that wants to introduce health educational products to children. And right now we're trying to exert pressure on governments, especially in Egypt, where now I'm lucky to be serving as an advisor to the president, uh, that we want to introduce health education as a subject in schools. It's no longer a luxury. It's no longer an inter entertainment for the children. It's their right to receive life-saving health education and messages as part of the educational system. Outstanding, and actually I was gonna get into that sustainability because I think with all of you, we all have to keep in mind that we have great ideas and we start in a grassroots level, but at some point to be successful and to reach the masses, you know, you have to have sustainability. And you have to think of things on a systems level, but we'll get into that at, at, in our closing remarks. So Dina, Dina is a, a a phenomenal researcher. I have read. I've read quite a few of your your papers, and um, I can't wait to read more. Um, and um, can you tell us about the research that is emerging regarding health education and utilizing the media, since this is such a, an area that you have done so much wonderful work with? Sure, and it ties into what both of you just said. If you're going to create good products, one of the things that you really need to do is show the evidence whether or not it works. Um, my area of expertise is research and evaluation. So I'm hired by Sesame to collect data on the impact of their programs. So I know my place. I'm a nerd. Um, I'm good with numbers. I teach the intro biostatistics course in public health. Um, and I love good questions and good analyses. Collecting valid and reliable data is what's going to be able to continue these efforts. So if you have a good product, maybe it's small scale, make sure you're collecting information about pre-post change. If you can do a randomized control trial, do it. It's worth the money because if you have the numbers and the data afterwards, you can go back to funders and you can present it in a way that they can understand. Do not write up papers that just are fancy analyses. Write up your results so people can understand the impact of your programs. And it is true. In the nonprofit world, we're seeing more of that. Um, even just private donors are getting much more savvy with results and outcomes. In the old days, you can just kind of have, uh, have lunch with a, a donor and, and um, you know, just have a nice conversation, and they'll, they would write you a check. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. So even in the simplest of, of, of uh, transactions with um, supporters, um, you are going to have to present some type of outcomes and data. So you need to be thinking about that on the, on the front end so that you can, as you're doing your work, collect meaningful data that is going to um, basically sell your program. So it, maybe we can talk a little bit more about, about that now before we run out of time in terms of sustainability. And Mohammed, you mentioned that you're going to be actually working with the government because I think that's key is to once you, once you get to a certain level, you have to take it to the next. And so, um, Jordan, tell us about how you see your um, immunizations, by the way. I mean, your program is just, I, I want to <laughs> pick your brain about how to do that in this country because um, even, even in our own backyard, we have a great problem with immunization rates. And as a matter of fact, if I'm sure all of you have heard about the measles outbreaks um, because of uh, lack of, of immunization. So tell us a little bit about how you foresee you know, your, your program going to the next level. Right. Um, so um, <laughs> yeah, I wish as much as I wish that we could take this to the United States, I'm not sure that text messages would be the best way of persuading people here. Um, that's such a big problem, and I don't know exactly how it's going to go in the future. Um, but for me, um, we started by piloting at one clinic, um, and we've been working with that clinic for for about a year and a half now, and. Um, Exactly what we were talking about, about proving that your information works, um, is was the most important thing we could have possibly done in terms of convincing the UN to scale our program. Um, so, like I said earlier, I went and made evaluating our program, my thesis project, which is very 
Um, again, wonky biostatistics, um, research study design, and things like that. But investing time in that and um, getting taking classes maybe or, or doing your own research to get those skills is so important in convincing people to take you seriously and convincing partners to take you seriously as a student um, because you, they can't argue with that. They can't say you're too young if you're if you have the numbers and if you can prove that what you're doing is really, really and truly effective. Um, so for me, the big question um, was, what do I wanna do after I graduate? Do I want to work on this for the rest of my life? Do I wanna take it and make it a, a do I want to maintain my nonprofit forever? Is this what I wanna do? Um, and for me, the answer was no. Um, I'm probably going to go and get a different job after I graduate. So in terms of sustainability, the most important thing for our project was getting to the point where the UN could take it on themselves, um, where instead of managing text messages from the United States um, at 4 a.m. or whenever it was daytime in Jordan, I would, um, I would go in and send out a batch of messages, clean up the phone numbers, send them out. And that's not sustainable at all. That's sustainable for one clinic um, for a few months or until I get burned out on, on that. Um, and for us, um, in terms of long-term sustainability, we wanted to get to the point where the nurses at each individual clinic could take it on themselves, where our partner was so invested in our project that they wanted to, to manage it themselves. Um, so really, the end game for us was be so good and prove that this works so much that they want to invest in it and scale it throughout their clinic system. Um, so I think in terms of sustainability, it's really important to consider what your end game is and how many steps away that is from where you are right now and to pick out um, what you need to do next to get to whatever your end goal is, whether that's scaling or whether that's um, some sort of permanence of your project on the current scale. Well, and it's interesting, the, the life cycle of a nonprofit, it's pretty classic. Um, and you start at, at with an idea, a passion, you start at the grassroots level, you, you take it to a, the next level, and then it kind of comes to a point where you either have to you know, merge with a larger organization or it's something called sunsetting, where you actually kind of fizzle out. So um, fortunately for our nonprofit, we were just acquired by the Miami Project to cure paralysis. So our chapter for our nonprofit has closed and it's moved on to a, a bigger entity. So um, sometimes that's, that's where um, you know, no larger nonprofits take on your, your smaller nonprofit, and oftentimes the government um, uh, or you know, public entities will take, take over your project. And hopefully, Mohammed, if you wanna just add a little bit more about your, your discussions with the government and how you, you see um, that going to scale. Exactly. Um, uh, I'll give you several examples, uh, like the child labor age worldwide is now affected by policies. Uh, the minimum age for child marriage is affected by policies. Um, the female genital mutilation has been criminalized in almost the whole world because of policy change. So actually, policies do make a change, but we need to believe in, in this and we need to pressurize the governments and the international agencies. In this case would be the WHO, the UNICEF, and um, the different entities that would be interested in this to introduce the concept that health education is a right for children. Uh, if we do this, I'm trying to do, it, to do it locally in Egypt, but I also hope that people amongst you who are interested in public health, they should work on more international levels and locally in their own countries to introduce the concept that health education is a right. It's not a luxury, it's not entertainment. The other thing, if any of you wants to have an internship with us in Egypt, you, you are more than welcome to come to Egypt and work with us for a month, two, three, wh whatever you want. Uh, the other point is that about scaling up. Uh, yesterday, when you were on stage, you were saying that three children came back to the clinic or three mothers came with their children to get, to get vaccinated again, although they, they weren't going to vaccinate their children because of her project. Uh, some people might say three is a small number, but honestly, in, in my culture, there is a saying that if you save the life of one person, it is as if you have saved the lives of the whole mankind. So one person does make a difference. This person might be the next Mandela or Gandhi or whatever, we don't know. So we are focusing on scaling up, but at the same time, be happy and feel proud of the lives that you have changed in front of you. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is those stories and the impact, one, one person, one case at a time, really, 
it, it helps drive you to keep going and to reach more people. There's nothing that's a, a greater feeling than that. Dina, tell us a little bit about you know, the, the, the sustainability and the bigger picture and the impact of your work um, with Sesame Street and, and where you see the future is with those types of, of uh, programs. So I'm very fortunate to work with a wonderful organization. Sesame Workshop has a mission when they do international co-productions that they don't bring Americans into a country and then just produce materials there. Their mission, and I'm part of that mission, is to create a sustainable product in that country. So given my experience, I'm fortunate I get to work in a lot of countries, but usually I only get to work there for a short period because what we do is on in terms of both production and research, we develop in-country teams. So yes, Americans may come in and teach skills, whether they be production skills or creating Muppets or creating stories or script writing, that's the production end of it. On my end, I usually find some sort of base at the universities or through research companies and I develop a research team in country. I, I find a hardworking, thinks outside of the box person there who knows the culture, who knows the context. And I work with that individual to train that individual. And that individual trains a team. And for what it's worth, I usually, like I said, I, I ease myself out of a job very, very quickly in every single country I work because I develop great research teams on the ground. And that's what's really happened for some of the Sesame Workshop stuff. So they develop their own studios, own production, and their own research. And that's what makes the Sesame product authentic in each of these countries. That's fabulous, fabulous. Um, let's talk a little bit about economic impact. Because I think that when we talk about scalability and sustainability, one of the messages that we have to convey to our supporters, especially governmental entities, is the economic impact of our work. So talk a little bit about that, about how, how your programs can, um, how do you make that argument with those um, entities that are going to help um, bring it to the next level? Um, there was actually a paper uh, published here in the US, I, I don't remember from which university was it, but it said that for every dollar spent on preventive medicine, five dollars are saved in therapeutic medicine. So actually, if we invest in health education, this is not money that's thrown in the ground. This is an actual investment that would decrease the expenditure of individuals and of governments as a whole on treating these people if they get ill one day. Uh, the other point is the cost effectiveness of using technology in this. Okay, so now health education is cost effective. So how do we implement it? Do we implement it by Muppets and cartoons and so on, or do we implement it by posters and flyers? Uh, the, uh, I'll give you an example with numbers. So these are the comic books that we have produced. Uh, when we wanted to scale it up to 100,000 children in Egypt, we have seven books of these. So printing 700,000 books in Egypt would have costed us much, much more than producing seven cartoon episodes and just copying them on USB flash memories or CDs or just telling the people to download them for free from YouTube. Uh, so technology decreases your expenses. Technology makes it much more um, um, faster and more uh, flexible to reach different parts and uh, remote areas of your country. Um, I can give a really specific example, and I, I don't know, um, I hope it's illustrative of, of ways to use money to be creatively persuasive. Um, so we had, we did have three babies who were, um, who were over a hundred days late. So these are like extremely late babies. Um, but we've had many, many hundreds, I think about 1,200 now babies who've come in, um, with shorter delays after shorter delays after receiving our messages. Um, and the way I sold that to the clinic director, um, was by telling them that, um, um, so the nurses at each clinic would call before we implemented our text messages. The nurses would call every parent who had missed their vaccine appointment. And I don't know how many of you answer every phone call you get, especially if it's from an unknown number, but I definitely do not. Um, and people in Jordan change their cell phone numbers um, 
occasionally, so sometimes they won't pick up and um, it'll be just a dead number and the nurses won't know it, so they'll keep calling it every single week. So when we were convincing them to switch to text messages, the argument we made was um, we did it by time. So I sat in the office, I recorded how much time the nurses spent calling these people, and then I calculated out the expense of that based upon the, um, the weekly salary of the nurses. And I was saying, instead of using paying the nurse to do this, you're paying the nurse um, hundreds of dollars to spend time on these phone calls when instead she could be seeing patients, you could save that money by using text messages. So using sort of unconventional economic arguments, it's going to really depend on your project. Um, but all of these organizations that we're working with in public health, I mean, it's they're normally strapped for cash, um, so you have to get creative when economically justifying your projects. So in our last two minutes, we're going to give everyone a little bit of just a short uh, opportunity to um, just uh, some closing remarks, anything that you wanted to mention to the group. Um, my only advice is to, we've covered a lot. Um, one thing we didn't touch upon is when you form your teams, have somebody on your team that has business um, acumen, um, somebody who can make a business plan for you because at the end of the day, it's organizational skills, financial skills, you know, to be able to run, um, you know, when you get it to that level, a lot of great ideas and great nonprofits kind of fizzle out because they don't have those um, pieces uh, in place. So, you know, keep that in the back of your mind, um, even though many of us never really had any business uh, background, you know, have somebody on your team that, that can do that. So, uh, Dina, you wanna? I'm gonna, I'll follow up directly on that. Um, the analogy I want to make is that of a puzzle. When you start a jigsaw puzzle, and in my house we call it cheating if you look back at the picture, but um, if you start a puzzle, you know the big picture. But there are many different distinct pieces, sizes, and colors that come together, that fit together to make that big picture. Don't try to do all of them. You know, if I know my strength is in research. Um, other people have strength in media production. Other people have strengths in business. Create a team and put those pieces together to create your big picture. Excellent, yes. Mohammed? Um, the last thing I would like to say is that um, right now I'm a neurosurgery resident uh, and I've never accomplished anything that's worth talking about in neurosurgery so far. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here talking to you because of what I started as a medical student. So no matter how young you are, it's your passion that you put in the work you do that would be acknowledged by the people around you. So I believe that you can actually lead the world and you can actually change something in the world around you at any age. Jordan? I think the last thing I would like to say is that when you're working in public health, it's such an interdisciplinary field. You're going to be talking to people from all sorts of different backgrounds, and they may not think that public health projects are relevant to their interests. They may be a bureaucrat in an agency. They may run a hospital. They may um, be um, educators or something like that, and you're going to have to figure out how to persuade them that your project is relevant to what they're doing. Um, so I would spend some time thinking about how your project connects to all of these different fields and using that to build a wide network of, of people and potential partners that you can work with. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank all three of you for a very lively and formative discussion. And now we're going to open it up to questions. So if anybody has any questions, we'll have somebody running around with the mic and we'd be happy to um, to answer any questions. Okay, right there. Hi, I'm Puleng. I'm a third year student from McAllister College, originally from South Africa. Um, my question is, like there's been a lot of interest in e-health, especially in developing countries. However, it requires a very integrative approach because a lot of people don't have access to cell phone towers some people may not have access to buy books or like television for sesame products. So how do you solve that problem to make sure that the people who actually need this information get it? Because otherwise, you're serving the very community that could other, like that could access those services without even watching or looking at those things. 
so I can tell you um, the last pro I'm going to jump right in. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the last project that I've been working on is a Gates-funded project that's in India, Bangladesh, and Nigeria. Um, it's the one with Raya, and we are specifically targeting some of those hardest to reach, most vulnerable populations. So we are working in the slums of Cal Calcutta. We're working in the tea gardens in Bangladesh. We're working outside of Abuja in Nigeria, in the northern part of the country. And so most of the time, I am surprised, but I find that there is media on the ground. There may not be running water. There may not be soap, but there's a television, and there's a generator for that television. Not always, but often. In India, we are seeing higher rates of mobile phones than the population. There are more mobile phones in India than people at this point. So I, I would suggest that don't be dissuaded by thinking, oh, there's no technology, and there's e-technology won't work. I think it will. <laughs> that said, we also, with Sesame, do go on the ground, and we do community-based activities, and we do dramatic events, and we do work right in the community where we engage kids to participate in music and dance, and we actually bring Muppets to them in the slums of Calcutta. Um, I would like to add to that, that to me it's important not to force it. Um, mobile health and e-health are like really sexy things to work on right now and it's easy to come up with projects. It's easy to find your computer science friend who can write you up an app. Um, but it may not be what's best for the community. It may not be the best way to convey your information. It may not be the best medium to accomplish what you ultimately want to accomplish in, in terms of health change. So I think it's important to spend time working in the area you're going to or you're interested in working in and figuring out whether or not this is actually the most appropriate um, way of, of getting what you want done. Other questions? In the back here. With the glasses. Well, actually, here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is to Dr. Barza Kauzi. Um, so uh, how, do how do you measure the efficacy of, like, the message you're sending to children, um, w like, without, like, giving them, like, some kind of standardized test that, like, they take? Like, um, like how, do how, do you how do you measure that the message is sticking to the children? So I love measurement issues. These, this, is, this is my bread and butter. I, l I get very excited about it. What's the best way to ask a question of a three to seven year old? And we spend a huge amount of time trying to design instruments. Usually they're delivered with one data collector and one child. So we work one on one with a kid and we have a lot of picture based instruments. But for example, Asking the question, did you watch Takalani Sesame or Gali Gali Simpson yesterday is a stupid question. I would never ask that of a child that age. We spend a lot of time instead developing character cards. And to measure exposure to our program, we actually flip through that, those character cards and we ask the child to provide the name of that character. And we create a scale of exposure. The more characters you can name, the more likely you've seen that show. So we measure exposure by doing character cards. Looking at, we look at outcomes from understanding to appeal to behavior change. And we will ask about, in very, very creative ways, using pictures, have they engaged in different behaviors? So we will ask unprompted questions, such as, when you woke up this morning, tell me what you did. And we'll have that kid. So these are one-on-one -on -one, um, interviews. And the child may say, well, I collected water. I went to the latrine. I helped my baby brother. And you could go through that. And then you go back and you specifically go on the questions that the statements that they made. And you ask very directed questions. We are also trying very hard in our data collection to work on observation um, because self-report doesn't always work. So we will have data collectors 
look down and say, is the child wearing shoes? Yes or no? We'll have those measures there. We will, when we go into a household, we will ask the child to show us, show me where you sleep. Show me where you go to the latrine. And we, <laughs> I've done latrine tours before. And you basically will go to the latrine and you, and you can reflect back on the question. You say, where do you wash your hands? If they can't show you where they wash their hands, then you, then you know you have a problem. You can look around. Is there soap there? So the researcher will look for a soap. But if it's not there, then they will say, okay, is there soap here? And the child will pull it out if it's there. And if it's not there, they can't. Other questions? Right up here at the front. Am I get <laughs> trying to spread the wealth here. Hi, my name's Taylor. Um, I'm a sophomore here at University of Miami. Um, my question is that when dealing with child health, um, often, as I'm sure you guys are aware, children don't often have autonomy of their health, that it's usually directed towards the parents because they're the ones kind of in control of the child's health care. Um, have you guys run into issues with health literacy of the parents and trying to implement programs that way, especially in areas where there's language barriers? Well, I deal with that on a daily basis in my world. I take care of children from Haiti, children from Central America, South America, um, and that's a big challenge. Um, but that's communicating with the parent, and unfortunately, the literacy level of the parent affects the ability for us to be able to um, deal with what, what's happening with the child. So yes, that's a struggle. Um, we do our best to try to be sensitive to that. Um, also cultural norms, it's another big issue, you know, whether or not they, um, you know, they have uh, alternative practices. We don't want to shun what they do. We want to kind of um, work with them and let them know that we're trying, we respect their, their um, cultural norms, but that this, you need to also try these things for your child. So, uh, yes, I think health literacy on the adult level is, is a, a whole separate issue than health education in, in young children because young children can, can be autonomous. Five-year-olds can go wash their hands before they go to, the, to lunch. You know, so again, I think that that's, that's something that th these programs are, are able to have, have young children be autonomous with their health. Let me just jump in on one thing. We found a, so we had a, a situation in Nigeria, in northern Nigeria, where we were looking at um, going to the latrine and wearing your sandals when you go to the latrine. And when we got to the place where we were doing our work, there were no latrines. So our message about wear your sandals to the latrine wasn't really a, an appropriate message any longer. However, we were a little bit subversive. And as part of our intervention, we were teaching kids they have the right to a latrine. And there may be corruption in the community, but every child has the right to a clean latrine. And as part of this, yes, the infrastructure wasn't there, but we were trying to teach kids that they had every right to have a latrine. Uh, I, I might add also a point that uh, when we provide the children with the coloring comic books and the cartoons, we encourage them to let their parents watch th with them. It's very engaging. Uh, um, if you let the child is the one attracting the parent to this particular issue. At one point, a child asked his father, why are you smoking at home? Isn't this dangerous for me? If I tried for 100 years to explain to the father that this is dangerous for his child, it would not have been that effective as his child asking him. Uh, another, another point would be, uh, because some parents are illiterate, so they can't read with their children this comic book or whatever. Uh, we did competitions for them, and we told them that we'll explain some stuff for you, and then we have multiple choice questions, and if you as answer them uh, correctly, you'll get the prize. Uh, if I talk to him about anything, he will listen to it because he wants the prize. So we talk to him about the, the certain disease we are addressing today, and then after, after explaining it, we give them the questions. Of course, they can't read it, so we read it out loudly for them, and they choose the answers. Uh, what they don't know is that all of them are winners, and we will give prizes equal to the number of attendees. It, it's not related to their answers. And if they answer wrong, uh, the volunteer next to him would explain to him why is this a wrong answer. 
and the prize is actually our educational tools. So again, it's what we were going to give them. <laughs> Very good. Uh, one more question. Um, okay. You Hi, my name is Subruta Ravanti, and I'm from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, my question kind of has to go along with what you just talked about, uh, the latrines. Um, a lot of times, like we work in different places around the world, um, where working with the government's not always that easy, and sometimes just doing it our own way through like nonprofit efforts is more effective in the short run. Um, I was wondering if you could just um, elaborate a little bit on the challenges with getting involved with the government versus not getting involved with the government. Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I'll tell you a very funny incident with the government to tell you that, as you said, sometimes it's much more easier and faster to work just behind their back. Uh, uh, at one point, we had a project that we wanted the people to feel the suffering of the people with disabilities in the developing world. In Egypt, for example, we don't have much facilities that makes uh, that make life easier for people with visual disabilities, uh, whether it's in education, employment, or whatever. So we, we, we prepared an area where they will have a dinner in the dark. In this area, it's completely dark, and people uh, and at this point, we got celebrities with children who are blind to get into this, this place. They will sit on a table as if it's a normal restaurant. The menu is the menu of the restaurant and a menu uh, printed in braille and then they would have to order food. Um, so the government refused us to get the children in there, and their rationale for this is that we are doctors, so we might take the children in there and then steal their organs. He literally said that. Uh, I told him the parents are just outside the room, so. <laughs> and he said, y you can do this, and then uh, it would be a problem for the government that we agreed for this. So I told him, well, the dinner is set on this date and we will do it regardless of your approval or not. They got really furious and I could have got my NGO to get closed for this. So I went to a lawyer and told him I'm in this trouble now and I have to do it on this day. So he said, just let the parents sign a consent that they want the children to be with you and the government doesn't have to do anything with it. So sometimes it's much more easier. If, if I didn't go to this guy, it would have been much more easier. Um. This is another area where I think it's really important to go and talk to people and ask them who, which organizations do you, they trust and wh who do they think has the power to impact their lives. Um, so for example, for me, I work with refugees in Jordan and they don't necessarily, I mean, a lot of them have Jordanian citizenship, but they don't necessarily view the government of Jordan as the one responsible for providing their health care. They view the UN Refugee Agency as as the organization that they trust. Um, in other places, it might be nonprofits. Um, in other places, there might be 50 billion nonprofits that are all small and they don't view them as effective. So I think it's really important to talk to people and figure out do they think um, the change you're trying to make can come from this, from this particular type of organization. And when it comes to governments versus non-governments, you kind of have to, com it's almost a scale between flexibility and like quantity, like, the government advantage is always you can reach more people, um, but your project might have to be subject to more restrictions. One final point. You should also be looking for gatekeepers and people in the, the government or celebrities who will help your cause. So um, I worked on a project with MTV in Kenya a few years ago, and um, it was an HIV AIDS program called SUGA. The star of Suga, some of you may know, is a woman named Lupita Nyong'o, who was the daughter of one of the ministers in Kenya and ambassadors. She was the star of our program. She got naked in that program, and she did go to her father and say, I'm starring in this, and this is important. And her father actually understood. So through Lupita, we got to the ministers of health, and we got to the government. And that access was completely invaluable. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you all again. Uh, wonderful discussion. <laughs> Great questions. So now we're gonna have a little bit of time amongst ourselves to have some discussions at the tables, and then uh, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes to kind of share what uh, you all have, have talked about.